going preparing Good afternoon and welcome to Azapo Online. My name is Khauntibale Nodoba and uh, I am the Secretary for Publicity and Information of Azapo. We opened with a theme, with a theme song that says Tina Sizwe Esimnyama, We the Black Nation. We are crying for our land. Sikalela is related to, because our land was taken by those that invaded the land and those happened to be, to be white people. We thought we should start with a theme song introducing the webinar of this afternoon, November 13th, 2022 where we are going to look at a topical issue, an issue that has become pertinent and important for us to discuss. The topic is governance and also institutional culture, in particular, systemic institutional culture that assumes the form of racism, particularly at what is called historically white universities in South Africa, Azania. 
But also coupled to that, we will be looking at the call for the establishment of commission or commissions of inquiry in trying to assist these universities to navigate what has come. Now in the media, it's contested whether we talk about governance crisis or whether we say is governance dysfunction and uh, whether it's governance dysfunction or governance crisis as a result of the institutional culture, which many would say is based on systemic institutional racism. We, we have seen commissions of inquiry coming up, being established, making recommendations and nothing happens. Recently in this past week, the commission headed by Justice Cis Kampempe, which was based on racism, investigating racism at Stellenbosch University, has been published. But as soon as it reached, reached the shelves, before even Stellenbosch University itself could deliberate on the commission that they set up, comes the Democratic Alliance. And they say they are taking that commission report on review. Meanwhile, those that have set up that commission have hardly even discussed and looked at what it says. This afternoon, I am, I've got the honor of introducing distinguished scholars who have been traversing this trajectory of transformation, change, uh, and also we've seen it all in terms of decolonizing the curriculum, transforming the institutions, but also have interacted with activists from the roads must fall and the fees must fall. I've got Dr. Comrade Dr. Chinyoka, who is the spokesperson of the concerned Black UCT staff and concerned Black UCT academics. Comrade Dr. Chinyonka is not a stranger uh, on Azapo Online. He has been here before when he talked to us about a very sensitive issue as well, immigration and inact policies of this country. So he needs no introduction, suffice it to say, he's a social justice activist, he, he holds a PhD in applied mathematics. He is an academic in, at UCT, also a member of the Black Academic Caucus, but also he represents academics on the UCT Senate and also on the Institutional Forum. He also serves in the DSA in his capacity as a, word, a residence warden. Uh, that's comrade Dr. Chinoka. Then I've got uh, Professor Rodney Chaka, who is an activist and member of ASAPO. Uh, just before, uh, I think two, three months ago, he was the, the head of ASAPO's uh, foreign, uh, foreign affairs portfolio as a secretariat. But because of his busy schedule, as you will see, as I'll read out, his credentials, he's a professor of ethics and systematic theology, and he's also a director of the School of Humanities at the University of South Africa, UNISA. Uh, professor Chaka also, like I indicated, as, as an activist of Azapo, he has been in this movement of Biko for many years, many decades. And uh, in his role in UNISA also as a researcher, uh, he's also a published scholar together with Dr. Chinyoka. They're both widely published. So we are honored to have these two distinguished scholars and activists with us. Then in absentia, I've got uh, comrade Lindo Kutle Patiwe, who is a postgraduate student at the University of Cape Town. 
but uh, he is in this capacity if we'll get him on uh, as a rose must fall and a feast must fall activist. But he's also a member of the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania. He is in its provincial leadership here in the Western Cape. So we hope we'll get him. But for now, we will continue with uh, my two guests, uh, Dr. Chinyoka and uh, Professor Chaka. Now, maybe what I will do is now that we are talking about the drama that has been happening, has been closer home, which is uh, at UCT. And Azako has been following this, uh, these developments. Uh, if my, my panelists agree, we will open up with Dr. Chinoka. So that, uh, because it's closer home, so that he talks to us. But then we'll come to Professor Chaka later on, because even though he's not at Stellenbosch University, but I think Stellenbosch is his alma mater as well. So <laughs> he, might, he, he might also want, as he makes his input, also talk to us about this commission, the, the, the Siskampempe Commission. But Dr. Chinyoka, a governance versus institutional culture. Are commissions of inquiry effective in assisting the functioning of institutions of higher learning? We have seen drama that has been happening at your university, where you are. We have seen you writing to the Minister of uh, Higher Education and Innovation. We have seen you writing to the Portfolio com Committee, right? And also, I think in a sense, uh, I'm not sure through your participation in the IF, written to the University Council as well. Share your views for us, uh, Dr. Chinyoka, and uh, me and uh, Professor Chaka will mute ourselves and also mute our cameras to allow you time. Over to you, Dr. Chinyoka. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Kao, and uh, thank you. Thanks to you and the team behind the Azapo Online webinar for webinar series for inviting me to this platform. And good afternoon to those in attendance. So it's it's a very uh, topical discussion, as you, you put it. Right. So so first, maybe to just look at the bigger picture, right? So why the why the commissions of inquiry will be necessary in the first place, right, at institutions of higher learning. So the institutions of higher learning, right, these public universities in particular, being established in terms of the Higher Education Act are expected to be governed by the university councils using the Higher Education Act as a framework and using their own institutional statutes as a sub framework. So when everything and happening as is supposed to happen in terms of the Higher Education Act, there will be no need to have any commission of inquiry to look into any matter at any public university because those matters should fall within the ambit and the mandate of the University Council, including its substructures, whether it's committees of council, whether it's, it's other statutory bodies, such as the Institutional Forum, the University Senate, and its subcommittees, such as the faculty boards and so forth. So when the public universities are working as they are expected to, in terms of the Higher Education Act, then there'll be no need for commissions of inquiry. <clears throat> but certainly, of course, that is not the case. So our public higher education institutions, especially those that are historically white institutions, rarely work within the framework of the higher education. And indeed, rarely work or act in the, within the statutory provisions of their own institutional statutes. So when you have such uh, an eventuality that the, the, the universities are now governed outside the statutory provisions provided for in the Higher Education Act, in the institutional statute, chaos ensues. The biggest one at historically white universities 
is of course institutional, systemic, and structural racism. If I look at the at the University of Cape Town as a case in point. The University of Cape Town in terms of its own institutional statute it requires or demands that all its structures from the council, the senate, the institutional forum, and then the substructures emanating from those uh, statutory bodies. UCT's own institutional statute demands that the composition of those structures pay specific attention to the two principles of diversity and inclusion. That's a demand, that's a requirement. It's not, a, it's not a, an option, it's not option, it's a requirement. Right. But if I look at the institutional, the, the UCT Senate, which is where almost all the problems from UCT seems to always emanate. The UCT Senate, its composition falls completely outside UCT's own institutional statute. And its functioning falls outside the Higher Education Act. So you have a structure, a statutory structure that does not operate within the Higher Education Act and whose composition does not reflect its own institutional statute. And what then that leads to is pervasive structural, systemic, and institutional racism. And that then leads to all the problems that we see that have been especially highlighted since 2015 through the hashtag must fall movement, starting from Roth must fall in 2015, check the OTRC in 2016, this must fall 2016, 2017, and of course the end outsourcing movements in 2016 and 2017. So all those activist movements are a response to institutional, structural, and systemic racism that comes as a result of the failure of governance at the universities, specifically in Vesel Cape Town. The failure to adhere to, uh, to adhere to the principles and provisions in the Higher Education Act and in the institutional statute. So if I Give a quick example. The Higher Education Act, when it comes to the composition of Senate, says that Senate must be composed of academic employees. It must be composed of employees who are not academic employees. And it must be composed of students. And when it comes to an academic employee, the Higher Education Act is very clear. It gives a definition of what an academic employee is. Right. Any employee who is employed to a teaching and research position, whether you're a lecturer, senior lecturer, associate professor, professor, or somebody who's in some kind of research fellow class. So those are academic employees. And the education act says those are the people who must form the majority of the members of Senate, in addition to members who are not academic employees, and in addition to students. <clears throat> But then what does the UCT statutory bodies do, the University Council and the University Senate, right? Historically then, because they always had Senate as the center of power at UCT, they now redesigned the institutional statute to say that the Senate must be composed of professors. That's not what the higher education acts say. Because the moment you say that the Senate must be composed of professors, and then you have token membership, people like myself, token membership of people who are not professors who are elected, now we have to fight for maybe a handful of positions that are outside the professoriate. Right? But essentially the composition is professors. You then ask yourself, who is a professor at UCT? A professor at UCT is a white male. Right? That's the persons who are in the absolute majority of that uh, academic position, academic rank. So just that 
clause in the UCT institutional statute itself is already in violation of UCT's own institutional statute. So you have an institutional statute that is contradictory, that is nonsensical. On one part, section 36 of the UCT institutional statute, it says the composition of this, all these structures from council, senate, the subcommittees, institutional forum, and so forth, must pay due regard to diversity and inclusion, and specifically for the inclusion of women, Black women in particular, and Black persons more generally. That's what the institutional statute says in section 36. Then you go on to another section where it says the composition must be professors. Where we know it's a historically white university or professors at UCT are white males. So that's a staunch, stark example of the systemic racism at UCT and how it manifests into the governance of the university. Because then, once you have such kind of a racist dispensation, there's going to be there's going to be challenges, right? Because those kinds of structures are going to make decisions that they have a racist also undertone. And people who are aggrieved of those kinds of uh, racist kind of decisions are going to now fight, which is what all these activist movements started with the Rose Maspo, Sheckville, is Maspo and so forth. And because of those activist movements now uh, highlighting the problems of institutional systemic and structural racism in the public domain, the universities are now forced through the University Council to say, let's establish a commission of inquiry to look into this. Let's establish a commission of inquiry to look but the underlying reason is that all those emanate from governance failures. So if you look at the first, uh, what, I, what, what I would now call the Sheckville TRC, what the investor prefers to call the, I, uh, the IRTC. That was the Commission of Inquiry established in 2018 to look into all those matters that started from the Rosmas Formal at Sheckville, especially started from the, uh, the terms of reference started from the Shack Bill, where the students had built a shack on upper campus at the University of Cape But then the commission then looked at all the issues emanating from an institutional culture in terms of the institutional racism. And then the findings of that commission were clear that not a single person who came before the commission could say that UCT is not a racist. That is the finding that they made. A follow-up commission that came in 2019, started in 2018, following the tragic passing of Professor Mayosi was the Mayosi Commission, whose report came out as well in 2020. So the Sheikh TRC report that came out in 2019. The Mayosi Commission report came out in 2020. And it focused on the institutional culture, especially as it uh, speaks to the experiences of Black leaders at UC. And one of their major findings was that the institutional culture at universities like the University of Cape Town is shaped by the academics, not by management. So you might have black managers, might have a black VC, a black chair of council, uh, and some black DVCs, but those are not the ones who shape the institutional culture. The institutional culture is shaped by the academic core. Right? And then who is the academics at UCT? Whites. Right. Those are the ones who shape. We just mentioned now, right now that the UCT Senate is a white structure, right? because of what they call in their institutional statute, that the composition must be professors. So you have white academics determining the institutional culture at UCT, and that institutional culture, of course, does not reflect the experiences and, and, and hopes of Black persons. And that leads to problems especially problems of institutional, systemic, and structural racism. Right? And then when people push back against those problems that they face in terms of racism, that's where the university, because it doesn't have answers, because the answers must come from the very same structures who are causing the problems, the same governance structures. Then they are forced to establish commissions of inquiry. But what we have seen is that the commissions of inquiry only highlight the problem that is already known. We already knew that UCT is a racist place. So the Sheikh the TRC is essentially just saying that's exactly what it is. UCT is a racist place. 
The Marcy Commission pointed out that the institutional culture is shaped by the academics. Right? So these are things that are well known. Right? So the question then is, now that the commission, they formally put everything, things that we all know in the public domain, is the university going to implement those? And that's where we find that the answer is, and it's sadly, maybe not, most likely not. At this city, we have not seen any movement in terms of the, implement, the genuine implementation of the recommendations of the Shagno TRC and the Miles Commission. So the only movement that we have seen so far is that after three years, the university has come up with a new policy. They call it the policy on anti-racism. So it tells us that, okay, if you feel that the, you, 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 you have identified the structure or system that is racist in nature, so you can report systemic racism through these channels. As to what happens once you report, we don't know. Right? Because the first thing that I'm going to do is to report the university senate through that anti-racism policy and see what happens. So we have commission reports that essentially are just uh, white elephants. They tell us what we know, but the universities are not willing to implement the recommendations. And the Stellenbosch case is a case in point, right? Well, before the university even decides whether they're going to accept the recommendation, a political party that has absolutely nothing to do with the investor structures has decided to take that report on review. Right. And that does not make any sense because in terms of the higher education act, the university is governed by the investor council. The investor council sets up a commission and it is the only structure that is allowed in terms of the constitution, which is where the higher education act comes from, to accept or reject the recommendation. So what we see now, the DA is saying at Stellenbosch is that if the council accept that uh, report, then we are saying the funders, the people who fund Stellenbosch investment must defund it. So that's what we are seeing happen. So, so the challenges that we see with the commissions of inquiry report is that they hold a mirror to the higher education institutions but the higher education institutions are not willing to introspect and are not willing to actually take the steps that are required to, to, to lead to corrective actions. So I'll pause there for now. So there's to allow the other panelists to come in, but the second part of my presentation, I think I'll engage with it as part of our, of our conversation. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Comrade uh, Dr. Chinyoka, for for that uh, uh, earth, I mean, earth-shattering input. Uh, we we will engage you later. Uh, let's uh, give over to uh, Professor uh, Rodney Rodney Chaka. Um, no, thank you very much, uh, Mkaya. Uh, you know, I was when I was uh, uh, thinking what to say to this very important question uh, in preparation for this conversation. I, <clears throat> I I could not but wonder whether whether or not this this does not show that it is the system and it is the structures. Uh, that we really have to to overhaul. Now, I just want to mention some of this before I I make some of my my input. You know, a, a number of a, a number of you guys would know that you know people in uh, in in leadership studies, uh, in business studies would speak about uh, cultures and how culture can eat up strategy. So you could have you could have all the nicest strategies, but if there are cultures that are hell bent uh, on not accepting such strategies, you you might as well forget about that. Uh, you're also reminded when people, you know, in the street when we say 
uh, yeah, uh, beat the dog and then you'll see the owner coming out. And so uh, when, when DA runs, runs a mock like this, it, it shows you that we will be very naive uh, to think that uh, there, is, there is nothing amiss uh, yeah, in, in these institutions. That, that is my first point. And the, the second point that I'd like to make is, is once again, we realize that these are not our institutions, Mkaya. These are not our institutions. <clears throat> and, and, and you can't then be, be surprised uh, when you see these kinds of reaction. Uh, people are clearly pushing back because they feel uh, that that uh, they are about to to lose to lose these things. Not only that, but the whole concept of university, really, the whole concept of university uh, is is something that is is very foreign uh, in this country, especially because even if you look at the structures, even in the architecture of universities, it's something that is really detached. Uh, from us and all our understanding of how knowledge get to be produced. That's the second point. The other question is, is who are the ones that are making these decisions? And so uh, I, I, I was thinking of, of, of a little reflection that Mafeje had made, Achiba Feje had made uh, when he was thinking about the controversy around uh, Mahmoud Mamdani and the and the African Studies Centers at, at your university. Uh, and, 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 and you know, <clears throat> and for me, he raises very interesting issues when he reflected on that matter. And, and some of these reflections are published in a little, uh, a little document uh, uh, <clears throat> that, that, is, that, is sim that he simply titles uh, the, the, <clears throat> the strange bad fellows, that being white liberals and black nationalists. Uh, strange bedfellows, and it was in Africa Review, and this was published in 1998. So, so, so the the gist of the argument that that he makes when he reflect on that, uh, he says, and I would like to quote this part: "White liberals who, through guile and deceit, make sure that ultimately they regulate and reign, even when exposed, they often get away with it because they enjoy certain immunity." immunity under the halo effect surrounding them and the resonance they receive from black nationalist liberals, close quote. And, and this is one of the reasons, for instance, <clears throat> why at this institution, and, 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 and the dog has just mentioned there, why at this institution particularly for the longest time, you know, professors has always been white. Uh, <clears throat> and, and, and so, so these are the issues that, 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 that for me really, if, if we understand that, the system is not meant really to take us seriously. We should therefore not be surprised when these kinds of reactions happen as they are happening, because we have not, and we are yet to deal with this very system that, that, not, that is now co-opted, you know, you know, black people now, we are now in this castle uh, called a university, but really we are not the owners of this castle. And so, and so that's why uh, when the statutes um, uh, seem not to be able to, to, to help us with crisis, we then sort of, uh, we, we outsource that to some kinds of, of, of institutions. Uh, and yet when doing that, because, because this, it is, the system is meant really to safeguard them. And, and that's why once that, that thing is threatened, you see the, the, the way that white people respond to this issue. So, so that, that, that would be my thing that <clears throat> I think we have never had a conversation to say uh, in, as much, in as much as we are brought into the spaces, uh, there has always be, been a very, very strange relationship between uh, what, what Mamdani has, has referred to as uh, the white liberals and our black nationalists because, <clears throat> and, and that's why we are so divided also in terms of how we respond to challenges that seem to be targeted at, at black leadership. And, and you know, white people will be so, so comfortable uh, seeing how black people now uh, enter that space and do what, what they have programmed them to do and not to see this thing as structural issues uh, that, that have never really sought uh, the views uh, and the insights of, of, of of black people in particular. Now, 
<clears throat> before I park, <clears throat> uh, I, I see, you know, what is now happening uh, in these spaces and in this drama that you have alluded to, uh, simply as, as, as that same attitude that, that was described by Mafeje, you know, just invading that kind of a space. So, so it, is not, it is not something new, it has always been the case. And, and our biggest, biggest challenge has always been that we would refer to our white liberal, you know, friends of the blacks, for instance, and so forth. And so we, we have, as black people outsourced that, we have allowed them the privilege of saying they can speak on and for our behalf. And this is, this is why many people are, are ignorant uh, to, to see that because because we don't, so the majority don't see an issue. Yet, if you are not tuned in, if you are not fine tuned to see the strangeness of this kind of relationship, uh, you'd be surprised, basically, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to definitely understand why these things are happening. I mean, we, we have had in the past uh, people really asking, why is it that only, <laughs> only white people at, uh, at, at, at UCT, for instance, become professors, you know, and even though you would have a number of black people quite prolific, you know, who, who would not also rise to that rank. So, so these are some of the issues. With regard to Stellenbosch, clearly, I, I, and, and I think here I must make use of that example of saying, if you hit the dog, the owner is going to come out, and that's why what we see with the reaction of the DA, uh, which uh, to the ignorant should signal that this thing is not, uh, you know, it is not as honest uh, or as uh, as uh, you know, it is not as insignificant as as many would like to think. It speaks to deep systemic structural problems. It speaks to cultures that have have not yet repented uh, from how they have perceived and continue uh, to perceive black people. You know, are we suddenly now rehumanized? Uh, because for the longest time, we were not seen uh, to be uh, proper full human beings. So when did that happen? When did that happen? And, and why are we surprised uh, that, that these things happen in the way that they happen? Uh, you see, so so this would be, uh, I think it would help us, uh, when I'm Kaya, if, if we say to us, first and foremost, this is the system, a system that is imposed, a system that has not atoned uh, for, for the number of wrongs that it has done towards, uh, towards Black people. And, and we are still, you know, performing uh, some kind of ambulance service, picking up uh, the, the, the accidents and not speaking to how these accidents happened in the first instance. And we have never yet in that space really spoke to some of these issues. I would like to pack uh, on that one, Kai. Uh, thank you very much, um, Kaya. Uh, I'm sure you and uh, Dr. Comrade Dr. Chinyoka can now switch on uh, your cameras and then also unmute uh, because now we are going to we are going to engage. Uh, just to apologize to members of the audience, I know we are followed on Azapo Facebook page. We are live there but also this platform we are followed by people uh, across the country, Azania, uh, in the region, in the continent, and overall in the diaspora. We, we also would like to apologize that uh, we seem not to, I think, uh, the thieving and the stealing that is happening at our SOEs has made it impossible for for our activist to join us because he, he finds himself in the township today. So there is this thing called load shedding and it goes with, with connectivity. Now, uh, colleagues, you both have touched, uh, you have touched a raw nerve. But before I go get to what you are saying, uh, here is here is some tutu zeli, here is some tutu zeli swans. Uh, in the chat, I'm sure you can see uh, what he's writing. Uh, he says, Prof makes a profound statement by saying these are not our institutions. How do we expropriate and nationalize these colonial institutions? Now that's the question that he's asking. And I think it will go to both you and, and, and comrade uh, uh, Chinyoka. 
uh, to then say as much as we've got these colonial systems, uh, we've got these systems, like you said, Ukaya, but as Dr. Chinyoka pointed out, you've got legislation that is supposed to guide and regulate the behavior and conduct of those who are in these institutions because they form part. Now, whether you agree or not, I know Azapo has got issues with this, with this democracy. I mean, Azapo calls it a, a bourgeois democracy, a quasi-democracy. But now, irrespective of, of how Azapo feels, uh, Dr. Chinyoka has brought up a fundamental point. You say, because you are a constitutional democracy, you therefore would have got to abide with provisions of the legislation that you have. And he, he immensely referred to the Higher Education Act 101 of 1997 to then say it outlines and give a blueprint of how institutional statutes and institutional governance structures should be like. And uh, because of what both of you pointed out and what Mutubu Zeliswar is referring to, the structures, and like you said, Mukaya, the, the, the systems, the systems, they are meant to safeguard whiteness and they can consume a culture. As Mutubu Zeli says, we must expropriate. Now, how do we expropriate and how do we nationalize? You do that through transformation. You do that through the decolonial process. You do that, Dr. Chinyoka, to now what you say, and it's very surprising coming from UCT that they've got an anti racism a policy. Now, Dr. Chinyoka pointed out that yes, the policy is there, you can report it, but if you report, then what happens thereafter? There's no guarantee in the system, all right? Then you guys pointed out the issue with Dr. Chinyoka, the issue of commissions of inquiry. They are there because there is dysfunction. There are malpractices. There is a, what one can call, for lack of a better expression, a manipulation of, of, of systems and the legal system. And Mkaya, like you said, where white liberals, as Mamdani say, have now arrogated to themselves that position, what we call positionality, of wanting to speak on behalf of Black people in these foreign institutions. Now, how do you expropriate them? And how do you nationalize them, right? He says a drama playing out at these former white universities. Uh, I don't know why he calls them former white. I'm sure Dr. Chinyoka will talk to them. Uh, are they former white or are they historically white? Do they still remain white? Or are they moving towards something that is not white? He calls them former white. So maybe you might want to give your, your, your views on, on that former white white matter. He says, uh, the drama playing out at these former white universities bears testimony uh, to that fact. What are the prof's views on how we take ownership of these institutions? So, mm. Mukaya, because now it's put on your lap, <laughs> let us start with you and then Dr. Chinyoka will then make a joinder as, as, sure. as we go along. I will, I will also check whether uh, in my panel, because I want to make this interactive. I want yeah. to check whether from the audience, is there anyone who's raising their hands, uh, who's got an, and it should be someone with an earth shattering thing that they would yeah. want to share with us. I'll also check on Facebook. Over to you, Mkai. Yeah, well, uh, Mkai, that's uh, it's, it's, it's a loaded, it's a, it's a loaded question. Uh, and, and I think there's a number of things that one must delineate. Uh, first, in as much as I believe that these are not in, in our institutions, I agree uh, that we have got a, a democratic right to be in this, these institutions. Okay. And I think also, if we are going to do this thing properly, we as Black people having this conversation needs, needs to be for the right and honest with ourselves. Okay. Now, uh, while it is not as obvious to speak of Black and white, we know today also that you have black people who are not black people. So, so say we have to get, we need to understand that. Uh, <clears throat> but, 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 but this come, this come uh, from the past and how we have been conditioned. Uh, we have been conditioned to such an extent, extent that if this thing is done very uh, correctly, you know, uh, uh, black self-hate is going to refuel itself for the longest time. 
So we have to we have to say that. Secondly, we in the space as academics, black academics in the space, we need to admit that we are part of the problem. And I've said this elsewhere. Uh, we are part of this problem because uh, sometimes we only react when the thing is addressed to me now. This is our problem that that it's all good and well until until something confronts me, and now suddenly. Uh, <clears throat> suddenly you know i have to appeal uh, to the masses so 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 we have to have that that thing we, we need we need to acknowledge as a people that there there are historical injustices that happen to a nation to a people to a group and not to individuals and so because you're not feeling the heat at a particular time does not mean you have to deny the majority who still languish in this context and who are still confronted on a daily basis by white supremacy and white racism and racism for instance so 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 that's my thing so i think we can only expropriate uh, these institutions which are ours if we start to have sincere and honest conversation with us as black people uh, you know why is it so easy that the da can suggest that its funders take their fund uh, their funds away from from stellenbosch you know why is it that black people don't see the need to have uh, you know, unity to get together and to do things unapologetically uh, black. We can't do that because first and foremost, we we had we had uh, we had outsourced our unity in that we have allowed white people to even speak on matters that they are not supposed to be speaking. And 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 we, you know, this with the ANC government and the negoti this negotiated settlement called South Africa, uh, the New South Africa, we we have done away with these kinds of issues. And, and and so and so so that's why we we, we find ourselves where, where we find it. and then the whole issue again Mkaya. Mm. Why why are we speaking about decoloniality in Africa, for instance? It shows you that there are things that happen in the past. It's, it's it's quite comfortable that these people would admit that we we should have a decolonial project without admitting what are the specific issues that went wrong in the past. Why mm. should we speak about transform transformation transforming to what from what? What has happened to this institutional ethos, for instance, and, and, and that's why we need to speak of transformation. So how is the ethos at the moment? Because okay. you, want to, you, you want to embrace transformation, whatever it is, but you don't want to say how uh, it is supposed to look like. So, so these are the things that I think uh, we can only get into the space when Black people admit that uh, sometimes we also have to you know, address a, a degree of the problem to us as Black intellectuals uh, uh, who are in this space uh, uh, who, who would, for the sake of promotion, deny certain things just because I want to be cozy with some white uh, liberals because they are the ones who held uh, the, the true power in these institutions. So, so I, I say we have to be very careful and sincere about how we go, how we go about with this. Okay, okay. No, thanks, Mukai. Uh, I see Dr. Rapesu's hand is up. I, I indicated in the chat, we will give him a chance to talk. Uh, I will react to some of the things that you raised, Mukaya, but let me give Dr. Chinyoka a, a bite now. Uh, Dr. Chinyoka, your take on the matter. Yes, no, thank you. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to add to this very important question. <clears throat> so, of course, firstly, a, a, an acknowledgement that these historically white investors are still very much white investors. So, we have not, that part has not changed, right? So, <laughs> okay. uh, we, we, we hear of language in various uh, spheres of whether we are or not we are in the post-colonial dispensation. I think that we need to put that into the proper perspective because we know, for example, in terms of, we were just talking about land uh, through that song that you, you started with at the beginning of this webinar. Right? Mm. So we know when it comes to the land, the economy, we are still firmly in the colonial era. So maybe in terms of in terms of political governance, we might now claim to be in the post-colonial era because we can elect uh, a black president. But in every other sense of the word, we are still firmly in the colonial era. Right? And that is exactly the same in higher education. In the higher education sector, we are still deep in the colonial era, which is why students' favorite phraseology is decolonization. We need to decolonize the higher education space because it's still very much colonial. 
And the, the universities like UCT, Stellenbosch are still very much colonial universities. They're still white universities. So essentially they must be decolonized. <clears throat> we must have universities that reflect their positionality on the African continent and in an African country. <clears throat> so, so for us to do that, right? of course we must also, like I pointed out at the beginning, uh, accept that in terms of the political dispensation, we're now in a constitutional democracy. Mm. And so to now balance the constitutional democracy and the need to now move the universities outside of the colonial framework in which that they still are embedded, we need to relook at exactly what are the structures that still maintain the colonial nature of our higher education. And we indicated that those are structural. Right? Mm -hmm. The structures and the systems in these universities are the ones that maintain the colonial discourse. Right? And one of the structures that we've been pointing out is the university senate. Okay. Professors, why professors, in terms of the commission that we have seen, that's the structure that determines the institutional culture at UCT. So the colonial institutional culture at UCT is primarily can be framed at the doorstep of the University Senate and its subcommittees, the faculty boards, the departmental boards, subcommittees, and so on. So what we need to do, so we, Today I'm speaking on behalf of the concerned black staff and concerned black academics at UCT. But back in 2019, when as part of the Black Academic Caucus, because we foresaw these problems arising out of the fallist movement, we proposed to the university a mechanism to decolonize our structures, starting with the university standards. To first relook at the institutional statute and make sure that we reimagine them. Because if you look at the Higher Education Act, the Higher Education Act, if we implement it as it is, we can actually lead to a space at UCT which does not have, which does not give the colonial powers to the structures that we have right now. So if we insist, for example, that the composition of the of the powerful structures at UCT is such as then must pay due regard to, to diversity and inclusion, inclusion of the voices that should matter in an African country, then overnight we can change the power of that structure. Mm. Because if you look at the appointment of academic employees to a university, so, so the appointment of any academic, of any employee to a university is done by the university council. And the mm. appointment academic employee is done by the University Council uh, in consultation with the Senate. Right? And because the University Council does not serve as a selection committee, it almost uh, uh, delegates that function to the University Senate through its uh, academic selection committees. And because of the whiteness of the structures, including those selection committees, the coloniality is reproduced in the appointments that we see. We always see the reappointment of white academics. We can dismantle that overnight by reimagining the composition and functioning of the, of the structures. Right. If you look at, say, the functioning of Senate, like the, the so-called crisis now that is happening in UC, right, which talks about the appointment of deputy vice chancellor. Hmm. The appointment of deputy vice chancellors, just like the appointment of vice chancellors, must be done by the University Council. And the Higher Education Act is clear that Senate cannot be involved. The University Council appoints management personnel and unlike with academic employees, it does not have to consult the University Senate. It only takes recommendations and advice from the institutional forum. Mm. But because, right, in the Higher Education Act, it says the University Council may delegate some of its responsibilities to an officer of the Council to an officer of the university to a sub substructure. What this colonial council of ours did was then to give a permanent delegation to the university senate to say, university senate, you are also now part of the appointment of deputy vice chancellor, which is not provided for in the Higher Education Act. 
So back in 2019, we pointed out all oh, those errors that those must be redone. The University Council can only delegate from time to time some of its responsibilities, but it cannot give permanent delegations the way it has done with the University Senate. Because that's where we are now, where the University Senate now believes that it is the one that appoints Deputy Vice Chancellor. In terms of the Higher Education Act, they should not be involved. Right? So the problems that we see are structural, they are systemic. We can resolve a lot of those overnight in terms of how do we so, so it, it's not even about nationalization or expropriation. That decolonization project, even with the majority white academics at UCT, we can reimagine Senate tomorrow and it will still be in line with the Higher Education Act, but it will be composed just like the Institutional Forum, paying due regard to diversity and inclusion, and the decision that it will take from next week onwards would reflect decisions that are not colonial in nature. Okay. okay. So the solutions are there. It's just that the, the, the people who must accept the solutions are the same colonial st structure. And they will not accept it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, 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 so if I hear you, Dr. Chinoka, and I also heard uh, Prof. Chaka, the inertia, the inertia, uh, the resistance to change is because we are expecting milk or water from a stone. Because the very people that we say must implement change, that change that must be implemented will actually impact on them. And uh, in some degree or to some degree, it will show their nakedness, their weaknesses. And uh, as uh, someone wrote uh, on the concept called white fragility, white fragility does not allow that to happen. So I hear you, but now there's Dr. Rapesu, and mm -hmm. his hand is up. Uh, let me go to him because I want to raise a number of issues with the two of you on what you raise. But let me let me let me allow Dr. Rapesu to talk. Uh, Dr. Rapesu, can you unmute and? Uh, Pose your question, please try to be brief. Dr. Rapesu, you can unmute now yes. and talk. Yes, I've unmuted. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Uh, what we are dealing with here is, 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 is actually a way of survival in an institution that is structured its own way. The whole thing reflects the failure of any institution, whether it's a black institution, trad a traditionally black institution. The whole thing about education has not been unfolded as much as the constitution itself is so liberal and free that, that it, it allows everything to happen, but it, at the same time says nothing will happen. You are, you are dealing with South Africa that is con, uh, controlled and governed by the liberal constitution itself. And that is the terrain of the white man. Mm. Mm. It's not your terrain. You are there as, as refugees, even in the black institutions. <laughs> Some of us who stayed in the black institutions for many years as students and even as, as academics, mm. we were aware that, long aware that the kind of education that is being offered here is not the kind of education that is offered for a liberated country. And, and of course, most of the time, when you appoint uh, people at the level of such institutions, you don't you don't really do your homework. Uh, as I mean, the whole thing is political. You you, you can uh, as you talk about the idea is is looking at its terrain and interest there, whether you are fiddling with their constitutionality, their their entrenchment there. That's why they come in, and and of course. Where money comes from to run this institution, black people 
have not done a homework as to reposition themselves as to how to run this institution. They come as employees, and as employees, you are subjected to the rules of what is there. Uh, mm. The standard that I, I said there, and of course, all, all people who are, who, work, who are in a working situation who are black are not mm. going to change, are not going to change this country. Okay. They, okay. they, they will cry and cry and, and get frustrated for that. As long as this country has allowed the entrenchment of the white and liberal institutions and the white and liberal thought to govern our day-to-day -day lives. It's not just the problem that you are experiencing in the academic world. It's what we are experiencing outside the academy. We, we are really faced with serious problems in this country. Some, you will address the problem you are immediately faced with. But the problem is bigger than what you are faced with. Okay, 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 yeah. Dr. Lapis, we hear you. Uh, you, are, you are saying to us as a farmer, as a farmer, uh, you are also experiencing uh, the, the effect of entrenched, entrenched whiteness and entrenched racism. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rapetu. Can we, we just want to allow sort of get into other dimensions, but I think you have made your point. Would you want a minute to conclude? Not, not so much of a minute to conclude. I, I just said, what is the nub of the problem of this country at okay. the moment? Okay, okay. No, 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 thank you. No, thank you, Dr. Rapiesu. Thank you, thank uh, you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, the problems that uh, Azapo says, a quasi, a quasi democracy, uh, a, a, a bourgeois democracy. Uh, uh, professor and, and Dr. Uh, uh, Chinyoka and Professor Chaka, just help me here. Uh, Professor Chaka, you are saying, uh, I'm paraphrasing what you're saying. And remember, I'm putting on my Azapo cap because I'm the spokesperson of Azapo. Uh, you are saying, if as a black person, you forget for some reason that you are black, then whites will remind you that you are black. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you then further go on to say that we as black people, at these institutions. We must also admit that some of us are the problem. Because you say there are blacks who are not white, or rather there are blacks who are not black. Mm. Now I want you to help me here, Mkhaya. What, what do you mean uh, that uh, we've got <coughs> blacks uh, that are not black, and that if we forget that we are blacks, whites will remind us of our blackness? How would they remind us? Uh, I, 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 I go to Stellenbosch, I go to UCT, I go to Firth, UNISA, Pretoria, and, uh, and I see black people and uh, they, they say to me they are black and they are proud to be black. Uh, and people will say I'm the first, I'm the first uh, black mathematician, I'm the flag, first black this, I've got white friends and whites respect me and, and all that kind of thing. I'm a role model to whites. Uh, and then uh, when we pick up problems, then they say, don't be racist. Because you, what you are saying, just like your Azapo, uh, you, are, you are racist. Uh, uh, because you are then saying here that uh, whenever there are, we've got issues, then we, we play the race card, all right? Uh, uh, the same thing that uh, would happen to me as a black person might also happen to a white person. So what is the problem? Yes. They are historically advantaged, but uh, uh, what do you mean? How can a white person remind me that I'm black? And how can I be black and not be black? Yeah. No, Mkaya, I mean, again, we go back to these, to the, to the, reflect, the, re, the reflections of Achima Feje, uh, who, who spoke when he, when, he, when he thought of UCT, he spoke and made that example of the difference between white liberals and the black nationalists. And he, and he spoke of how, how black people would get to rise up the ranks at UCT. Uh, because of course they, uh, they, 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 they count on the, on the benevolence and the pushing of white liberals. You know, if they say 
uh, <clears throat> how Diwali you're good. Yeah, uh, you know, their word, is, uh, their word carries much more weight than when Chaga say you're good. Okay. And we as black people have internalized that also. Uh, we know that if a commendation comes from a white person, it uh, carries much more weight than when it comes to a black uh, black person. And so, so you can understand uh, why why sometimes blacks don't want to wear the garment of the of the of blackness, because not 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 they're not nice things that come to that address. Uh, and, and and so 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 blackness as individuals does not carry that much weight as it does as as a group. So so I I, I am saying I am saying in a context uh, where you have people begging to be black, for instance, like you know that book that I read some time ago, Anki Croft begging to be black. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, it's it's nonsensical B because you see you see uh, black is a particular address. There's an address there. You see, white person, you can you can wish to be black because it's cool to be black. It's something that you can wear, stuff like that. But when you indicate where you are located, as a okay. black people uh, who, who who sits in 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 the truth of white racism, then, then you understand why it's important for us to still yeah. identify us as such. It's important. But then, of course, you'll also understand that there are some people who want to escape blackness. Mm. Uh, doing all that they can uh, to what I call flee from that because of, of what it, it comes from. So, so, so that's why, that's why I'm, I'm making that, that you might have uh, people who look like Chaka, but their whole ethos and outlook does not, does not say that as a black people, there are historical things that has happened and we have to acknowledge that. Uh, so, so, so that we, we have a multi-pronged approach of, of really, uh, completing our human humanity because we are still, we, we are a shattered people. We are a shattered people. No, 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 Kai. I want to, I want to go back to these institutions that don't belong to us because I think it is, it is very fundamental. Like yeah. for instance, if you look at, uh, if you look at the the Latin mottos that still endows most of this institution, a, a language that is practically dead. Now, now you ask yourself, you know. Why is it that uh, that that we we are just comfortable with these Latin things that are dead? They are privileging a dead language mm -hmm. over South African languages, for instance, because they, there is something called a spirituality of these okay. institutions, mm -hmm. and 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 we who want to look at these things only like we look at them rationally without understanding a rationality that made sure that white people and Afrikaner people could rise where they where they rose. So, 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 so you have a dead language that you privilege, and then you speak about decolonization. Yeah. And and, and if you look at most of these of uh, these Latin sayings, they have got one word that seems to be in common, and it's called lux, which is light. The perception that these institutions brought about light, and that is tied also to 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 the missionary Christian uh, history. That's why this. They are, when you look at uh, the the Grace College, for instance, in in, uh, in Blomfontein, they all have got mm. this Latin. Uh, Latin things, Latin things, they're privileging that. And it's always religious, you see? And so you ask yourself, how do you bring about decolonization when, when your whole ethos mm. enshrined in that motto speaks of having brought light to Africa, for instance? Why is it that, that many, many Africans are quite comfortable in the decolonial talk, but not re-Africanization, for instance? Just that simple difference. That you even have now white people in this decolonial bandwagon, but once you speak about re-Africanization, mm. uh, and what we mean by that is simply by saying highlighting the lived experiences and the dignity of African people, that these are the, the, the stories that should, should form part of, 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 of the institutional narratives, for instance. So, so, so that's what that I'm using very, very, very. Uh, you know, small examples, which actually are, are very loaded if you take the time to sort of uh, exfoliate the many layers that, 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 that with which they are covered. So, so these are the issues that say to us, until we begin to look not only at what we are seeing, but try to understand the spirituality that has for the longest time sustained these institutions, and then we'll understand why it is so stubborn and that they are so stubborn in bringing about necessary change, because okay. no one is going to just give these things away. We still believe 
in this country because we had this negotiated settlement that uh, oh, we were the luckiest ones. No one just give things away. And that is why you have white people now coming back, uh, being vocal on all the things basically that are in the public domain because they feel they have now earned their rights once again to speak and to tell us how we are messing this country up. Because okay. we are not just, we are not meant uh, to lead. You know, they never thought that we, we will find ourselves in these positions. Uh, they have tolerated us long enough now that they feel they can get to get get together and push back because we are messing okay. this country up in, in their view. We, have, we can only mess up. That's what we can do. Okay, okay. No, 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 I, I hear you, Mkai, uh, that uh, we, we, are, we are not meant to lead. Uh, Dr. Tinoka, uh, any reflections or, or insights or thoughts? Uh, that yes. uh, yeah, no, thank you very much. That's, that's, a, <clears throat> that's a very important uh, point that's on the, on, on the table right now. So the way I look at it is that the decolonial project is a multi-pronged project. So, so what we're going to do in the institutions that are historically white mm. is no different from what the nation faced coming from the colonial era in terms of the political framework to the so-called democratic era. <clears throat> so if you look at, say, the colonial times, if I look at South Africa during colonialism in the past, even though black persons are not a monolithic, they had a common purpose, which mm. was to fight coloniality and the past. Mm. And what we have seen now post 94 mm. is that that fact that blacks are not a monolithic group. So we have Azapo, we have EFF, we have ANC, we have HNSA. So on the political side, black people are now fighting right, battles that each group identifies. Okay. But what we forget is that the battles that we're fighting, even in the political framework post 94, are battles that are framed from the white agenda. Okay. The issue that the land question is not being addressed, the questions of the e economic ownership are not addressed, right? So those are agendas that are firmly controlled by whiteness. So it means our battles, even in the political arena, are still shaped by the white agenda. So it's the same thing at historically white university. The, the analogy there is that at historically white universities, we are just like the country pre-94. We are still in the colonial and apartheid dispensation. The white universities were still in the colonial era. We're still firmly in the colonial era. So what we are fighting, we have a common purpose to fight racism, mm. and fight coloniality. Right? So, but still black persons are not going to be a monolithic group, which is why we're going to have expressions that there are certain black persons who are not necessarily. Because you then, just like pre-94, you have people who are classified whichever way they're classified based on their affinity towards whiteness. We have the same thing at uh, universities such as UCT, where as a black person, uh, your positionality can also be defined in terms of your affinity towards whiteness or your affinity towards the black cause. But we're still in the colonial era. So what we are hoping is to say what happened in terms of the political space post 94 is what we're trying to get to as universities, that post-colonial era in the university. But it does not mean that once we get to that stage, our battle is won. Because just as we have seen in the political space, post 94, we just achieved one thing that now, of course, we now have this so-called political democracy, but we still have a long way to go. It's still the land issue that has been unresolved. It's still the economic issues that are unresolved. So 
So the, uh, the, the sad part is that we are unable to fight all those battles at once. Okay. We are fighting one battle at a time. So for right now at the universities, we're just fighting the decolonization battle, but it doesn't mean that afterwards we're going to, to not be fighting the curriculum issues, for example. Because the curriculum, like the colleagues say, it does not reflect our lived experience as Africans. So that's going to be right, a battle that we're going to continue fighting, even, even when we have the majority black. Thank you. Okay, okay. No, 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 no. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Chinyoka and, and also Professor uh, Chaka. Now, uh, before I get into the next angle that I want us to take uh, in, this, in this discussion, uh, I would like to, I'm sure you have seen this in the chat, uh, from the provincial chairperson of Azapo in Gauteng, uh, Comrade Hanare Lefok. Uh, I'm happy that he has raised this because uh, He's a practicing, he's a practicing attorney. Uh, he, he asks a question, Dr. Chinyok. And uh, Professor Chaka said, uh, largely these are these spaces, your UCTs, your Stellenbosch, uh, are not, uh, people still see them not as ours. Uh, we we is, is still what others will call foreign territory. Now we, we have seen the African, uh, they, 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 they have started with their model in Orania. Uh, me and Mkala come from the Northern Cape. We pass that area when we go to our homes. Uh, they have given that model of Orania. They have now come up with a university uh, of, in, in, is, it, is it somewhere there in Gauteng? Uh, I'm not sure whereabouts is it. Now, They've built it from the ground uh, through solidarity, linked to Afri Forum, and so on. Pushing the idea of Afrikaner nationalism and Afrikaner self-reliance and Afrikaner independence. Now, black consciousness of Stephen Bantubiko, his comrades uh, that were with him, Kupu Tiro and others, they also says, black person or black man, you are on your own. It pushes black self-reliance. It, it basically is anchored on black excellence and black self-love. But primarily, black solidarity was the envision, right, of a society that is an egalitarian society. Now, Comrade Kanare Lefoka says, is it really a mission impossible to start our own institutions reflecting the agenda of the majority, that is black people. Is it mission impossible? Then Dr. Chinyoka, we will not be sitting with all these problems of whiteness being the norm, of people not wanting to change. We'll have our own institutions. It will have a black agenda. <laughs> and uh, it, will then, it will then meet the aspirations of the majority of people in this country. And it will be a model to show that the dispensation that we got in 1994 was a lie. And that will now live out what we want to see, which Biko says will become an egalitarian society. Now, is it mission impossible? Why don't we take the talent of the Chinyokas of this world, the Chakas of this world, and we channel them into our own institution? And we leave these people on their own. We leave these people on their UCT. Uh, we leave these people where they are still in Bosch and we establish our own. That's what he said. Now, he now then goes on further to say, I think that we will forever lament the discrimination and subjugation of black people until we accept that we have to be catalysts and creators of our own institutions of higher learning. One recognizes the importance of the role of a responsive government. However, that should not be perceived as a condition precedent, none or, or prison other than uh, not, uh, uh, that, uh, that prevents black people led by the revolutionary intelligentsia from creating a black owned and black controlled institutions. I believe it's an urgent task and we have already delayed 28 years into the future since 1994. 
Therein lies our future and the demise of white racist instit liberal institutions if we establish an own. Dr. Chinoka, what would you say? Yes, no, that's, um, so of course that question encapsulates the hopes and dreams of many black persons. But I think the fundamental issue that we have to grapple with is that we do not own the UPAC. Okay. So, so solidarity can do that because they are owners on the economy. Okay. Right. So the people who own the economy in this country, we cannot deny that it's white people. That cannot be denied. That's why I was saying the post-94 era, just the only thing that was achieved was that political independence where we as blacks are now told that, yeah, you can go to the ballot box and, 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 and elect a black person. But the things, the colonial problems that we had before 94 in terms of land ownership, economy ownership, have persisted. They have not, they were not changed by 1990. So we do not have the economic uh, resources as black people in this country to, to even think about establishing those universities. We, we have a government right now that is struggling to find black students through NSS. Mm. So, so until we resolve the economic and land person, those are issues that we are not going to even be able to deal with. Right? I actually want to look at that the other way around. Right? There is no reason in an African country why we should be forced to start establishing black university. Okay. If we are now truly in a post-colonial era, mm -hmm. all our institutions, whether it's academic institutions, all our institutions should reflect the African reality. There'll be no need to establish a black institution. So I think what we need to do is to recognize that whichever spaces we're in, whether it's the political space, the economic space, the academic space, we are still fighting to unshackle ourselves from the shackles of colonialism and apartheid until we, and, and until we get to that space, there is not going to be there's not going to be any time when we're going to say now, okay, I think maybe our solutions are going to come from us forming a black institution. Okay. Us, admit, us forming black institutions is admitting that we have failed to confront the challenges that are before us, which is to decolonize the remaining spaces that are still colonial, the economic spaces, the land. Okay. I think we still need to remain focused. Okay, so, so Dr. Chiyoka, we are saying all institutions that we've got in this country, once we speak of a liberated country, then all spaces should reflect the ethos of a liberated zone in a liberated country. Okay. Yeah. Uh, solidarity, as Dr. Chinyoka says, they can do this because their handlers are the owners of the economy. We cannot do this because we don't own the economy. The question, why don't we own the economy? Are we not liberated? Or were we like to? Dr. Chinoka says we only got the vote. And that's what we got, political, so-called political freedoms that we've got. But the economy is still, is still white controlled. No wonder that manifest is what we see in your UCTs and your state of Mukaya, your take. No, I, I, I agree with... Uh... Uh, Dr. Chinoka, uh, ideally, ideally, <laughs> that, mm. that 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 should be the case. Uh, okay. It is just it is, it, and it also does not make sense that you would have in these institutions of higher learning a department called uh, African Studies in Africa, for instance, and it just shows you how foreign this whole idea of university is on the continent. 
Um, you see, uh, uh, Kwame Nkrumah in that very uh, obscure uh, title of a book, Conscientism, uh, uh, warns of, of, the, of the African student of philosophy. Okay. Uh, and, he, and he says, the, the, the African student of philosophy has got, <laughs> has, got, has got no business approaching philosophy in the way that Europeans do that. And, and for me, it's a very important warning in that it, it positions you properly so that you can, mm. you can, from that vantage point, begin to engage these institutions. And that's why I'm saying, <laughs> even, even as, as Blacks in these institutions, we have to remind ourselves oftentimes that this ain't your house mm. in the way that it is, in the way that, it's, that it is. <clears throat> And then I think uh, the, the, the second point would be, what do, you know, why is it that black people don't see the need to put together uh, the, the, their, their best uh, intellectuals, uh, best business people, uh, put them in one group and say, let us get this thing going. We don't do that because all of this, we are contingent on how we transact with the white world. Okay. So, 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 as a as 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 a, a black conscious scholar uh, who has to publish in articles that are con and journals that are controlled by by whites and in a culture of publish and perish, it, it it becomes it becomes quite easy to just say the odds are against me. Is that that's a problem? So we need to begin to to breathe life into that person who's become nothing but a shell of himself. We feel defeated from the okay. word go. I mean, why is it that we don't even have a school, a black, dedicated black school, a black hospital and stuff like that? Because all of these things are then subjected to policies that are not meant to make them function properly. I mean, I, I, I look at the, at, the, at the program that is accredited, uh, that, is, that must be accredited a new program and want to infuse African epistemologies and stuff like that. But the reviewers of that think that is nonsensical. You see, mm. so, 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 so this is where, 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 we, where we are located. And that's why I'm saying we need to have a, a covenant with black South Africa, where, where, we, where we get together and talk about these issues in a, in a way that we say, what, get, what can come out of this? But at the moment, uh, you know, uh, we are individually black only and we don't see a black as a group that just because you are not affected at the moment by these challenges, you don't see the need uh, to be in concert uh, with the majority of black people. So, so these are the issues that, that already disempower us as we want uh, to, to chat this way forward, Mkaya. So, But okay. it is not going to help us as black people not to speak about these issues and name, you know, even some of our black brothers who, who, who are not helping us in this process. The problem with us is that we are not blaming uh, each other and say, but Mukaya, you know, you, you, you are not helping our agenda. Okay. So, so these are the things that I'm saying that, you know, before I give up on you, Mukaya, I must have given you a try. I have okay. tried you and I've realized that now my brother's not going to come to the party. I'm giving up on that one. So we need to get together. You know, every time when there's talk about black unity, we are told how this thing is, you know, how this is obsolete and how this is so... Why is it when only we want to speak about the importance and essence of, of, of being together as a people and what we can achieve as a people and not as individuals? Okay. No, no, no. Thank you very much, Mkai. I know you have, you have touched a wrong nerve in Comrade Dr. Chinyoka uh, when you spoke about naming and shaming. Uh, I know him as, as an activist and uh, as a social activist. Uh, that, is, that is what he, he basically uh, lives by. That uh, we need to give people the benefit of the doubt. Don't write off a person, but engage them, right? And, and, and give them the opportunity mm -hmm. so that they basically disqualify themselves. Sure. Now, Mkaya, you have, you have brought up something very important, but I'm going to read something that... Uh, a professor, Joel Chigada, uh, another comrade and friend of mine, has put up in the, in the chat, but then also a question by Leslie Ntuli in the Q&A. And then I want to come to this, and that will become our last part of the discussion. 
and I might bring one or two people from the audience who are there. The part that you raised, we need to have a covenant with Black Azania or Black South Africa. We need to talk unashamedly about Black unity. And when Blackness is under attack, we need to rise. And, and I'll get to that later. But uh, Professor Chigada says, uh, thanks, Hanare, thanking the provincial chair of, of Houten Azapo that we've just responded to his question earlier on. Uh, thanks, Hanare, for the question. However, he then raises the issue that you and Dr. Chinyoka raised in Kaya. However, do we have the financial resources to start these institutions? Now, that question has been answered or we will find ourselves approaching these whites for their very same support. That's what he's saying. And I think Dr. Chinyoka raised that, um, uh, uh, that on eloquent and also Yumkaya to then say, uh, we are in an African country. So every institution should be African anyway, all right? So that should not arise. So otherwise we'll go cap in hand uh, to people. That's what he's saying. And then he says, it would be great to have these institutions but we are hamstrung in terms of lack of resources and the network to make black owned institutions. That's what he's saying. Now, Leslie Tully says powerless breeds, or rather powerlessness breeds a race of beggars. Biko, uh, that's what Biko was saying. That's what he said. Uh, are we still in that situation after 1994. Are we still powerless? That's what uh, Comrade Leslie Ntuli is saying. Are we still powerless? We've got a black government. We've got a black cabinet. We've got a black president. But why does it appear that even in this, or in, in this webinar, we, we seem to bring out that idea of powerlessness. Powerlessness breeds a race of beggars. Are we beggars while well, we are supposed to be in the driving seat? Dr. Chinyoka will come to this later on, but you have been asked these questions when I heard you when you were interviewed, I think, by SAFM and I think Power FM as well, and I think Newsroom Africa, where it was said, but you've got a black vice chancellor at UCT where you are. You've got a black chairperson of council, a black deputy chairperson of council. What are you complaining about? You are in power. Why does it appear as if you guys are now playing victim of powerlessness while you've got power? Now that's what Ntuli is saying. Can we still claim powerlessness when we are supposed to be in power? The same thing at these institutions. Vice Chancellor Professor Mamokheti Pake is black. May uh, Babalwa Ngonyama, the chairperson of council at UCT, she's black, with uh, a deputy uh, who is also black. Uh, there is uh, uh, May Peladi Gwangwa. They're all black. Where's the problem? Can you guys assist me on that? Before I come and get into what I want to say you now, the covenant with black South Africa. What would you say, Dr. Chinyoka? Uh, that's Peladi. Uh, rather than Leslie Tuli's question. Yeah, no, thank you. So that's always uh, one of the foremost questions in almost all platforms in democratic African countries that either you have the political power or if you're talking about higher education institutions that your leaders are black, so what exactly are you complaining about? But that argument misses a fundamental point. Like we said, our, our struggles are structural. Being structural, if I look at the political arena first, right? the fact that we got so-called political democracy in 94 in South Africa doesn't mean that political power brings any economic power with it. Okay. So, so the, the black government is still very much, they're still very much a collective of beggars. They have zero power. Right? The, the people who have the power are the same people who had the power before 90. 
So in the higher education institutions such as UCT, which are white institutions, it's even worse because, like I said, we're still very much in the colonial era. Right? So there has not been any even symbolic transfer of structural power. Right? Mm. So the, the stru structures that they held the power historically, which are structures such as the white dominated structures, such as the academic structures, Senate and so forth, they're still the structures that hold the power. In, say at UCT to this day. Right? So if I look at the so-called crisis that is widely reported at UCT, the crisis that was manufactured Okay. Senate. Uh -huh. in Senate because they have the power to manufacture and to diffuse any crisis that may or may not suit their agenda. So Dr. Chioka, are they manufacturing a crisis that has got a potential to hamper their, their reputation? Or no, 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 they're not. That. People see, that's the point. Might that's say, the, yes. The reputation that they're trying to hamper is the reputation of those black leaders that we have mentioned. Okay. This is why they are now seeing that they're now projecting themselves as the paragons of virtue that are trying to rescue now these institutions that have been so mismanaged by this black leadership that they now need white saviors. Mm -hmm. So they create okay. the crisis and then position themselves as them. So, 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 so. Why can they create that? Because they have this structure of power. Okay. So essentially the power still remains where it was pre-94. 94 didn't really change anything in terms of structure of power. Even the government that we have, they're just a collection of beggars. They, are not, they don't have any action. Okay, okay. No, 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 I, I hear you, uh, Dr. Chinoka. Uh, the, the paragons of, of perfection, the paragons of morality, who wants to save uh, UCT and other institutions led by Blacks from this uh, mediocrity that is uh, peddled by Black leadership, okay? Now I'll come to that uh, question later. Mkaya, what would your take be briefly uh, on this question of powerlessness that breeds a race of beggars that Biko said? Are we still powerless uh, uh, in this era? No, I, th I think the, the doc said, said it very, very clearly. You know, the problem is not individuals, but it is structural. It's, it's like what happened with the TRC in this country where you had individuals appearing before that commission and not speaking to the structure of apartheid really. Uh, you know, the whole infrastructure, the whole system thereof. So, so that's the problem. We tend uh, to say, you know, now that you have a, 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 a black president uh, forget about the past, you know, and this is this is what we hear all the time. You guys are in power. You guys are in power. So we don't people don't understand that it is a system that is a problem. And so when we're pushing back, we're simply saying the system needs correcting. The on the other question of of whether we are, uh, you know, whether it's it's so impossible to to start uh, an institution, I think sometimes the problem that uh, that stops us even before starting that is, is approaching this from a point of, of powerlessness already in that you have got an idea of what the university is and you think that if you're to start a university, it needs to look like that. And, and what compounds the problem even more is the likes of UCT with this uh, so-called excellence things. And then you ask yourself, whose excellence are we talking about? What are these things really that for the longest time has, has, has dehumanized black, black people, uh, you know, in search for a criteria of excellence that, that brings about a disjointedness from black people themselves. So, so we don't ask, we just assume these things. We mm -hmm. are, you know, leading the ranks, but, but who's, who's, who, who determines the criteria for this? Uh, you know, so, so the idea of, of what a university should be when we start it, that's the problem. So I think we need to, maybe when we approach that question differently, without looking at what is an example of a university, then, then, then we might get some mileage and, and maybe the encouragement uh, to start, to start uh, doing this. 
Okay. That, that, that would really be my, my, my response to this, uh, Mukai. Okay, okay, no thanks, Mukai. Uh, Comrade Nontobe Koyawa, uh, who is the Deputy Secretary for Foreign Affairs, says blackness, and I said she's joining us from the UK. Blackness isn't just about color of skin, it's about the mindset of the black person and their willingness to sacrifice to bring about change to benefit other, or to, or to the benefit of other black people. Which brings me to this question that uh, I think yours truly in an interview uh, was I think Salah Media, when the article came out by Daily Mavra, which in Azapo's view uh, was an article that borders on a, a, a mediocre journalism. It was sensationalist. Uh, I was then asked a question that are we not as black people who are in leadership through our conduct, not opening ourselves up for attack? And the question was speaking about corruption. Then I said, when we bring it to the vice chancellor of the University of Cape Town, an attack on her, it's not an attack on an individual. Now it has come out clear from the two of you to say the problem is the system. Like Dr. Chinyoka said, it's systemic institutional racism, which is the problem. The structures themselves, even if you are good intention to are appointed, you get in there. The structures are going to basically paralyze you. Now I then said the question on Professor Mamukheti Pakeng. I then also said, I'm going to drop the term professor and call a comrade. Because in Azapo, every black person is a potential member of us, even if they are not a member of us. And that's how Azapo asked me to put it up. And we then said, an attack on her is an attack on blackness. So blackness actually is actually being lynched by the white racist lynching mob, not here. And I indicated that they did it with Professor Ma Ma Malekhapuru Makoba adverts. And there is just a continuation, like the two of you said. Now this brings me to this question. And I want us to answer it clearly. Now that you have given us the framework and the foundation and the context of these institutions, and also taking it from the political dispensation of 1994. The question I have for you is as follows. Is there any justification for attacks on black female leaders, such as is currently the case at UCT, where the vice chancellor Mamokheti Pateng is being attacked, the chairperson of council, Baba Luang Gonyama, and her deputy, Paledi Gwangwa, are being attacked. Are these attacks justified in your view? And as you answer that, you might also want to touch on the racism report, Excel and Bosch by Kampempe, a justice campaign. What would your, your, your responses be, uh, colleagues? Uh, Dr. Tinyoka, it's close at home. Yeah, no, so thank you. <clears throat> so those are completely unwarranted and unjustified attacks because we have to look at what are the reasons for the attacks. So if, Say somebody was saying the VC stole money from the investor of Cape Town, that would be a different story. Right. So the, the reasons that are being put on the table are reasons that have nothing to do with any of the individuals that have been mentioned, the chair of council, deputy chair of council, and the vice chair. So like I said, it's a manufactured crisis based on the appointment or release from appointment of a deputy vice chair. And like I said, in terms of the higher education at the appointment and release from appointment of deputy vice chancellors is the responsibility of the university council. And at the University of Cape Town, in their institutional statute, they go even further to say that the university council can delegate or may delegate a lot of their responsibilities 
uh, to members of council, say to the chairperson, deputy chairperson, or to the vice chancellor, or to some structures such as institutional forum and senate and so forth. But there are certain responsibilities that they may, under no circumstance, delegate. Mm -hmm. One of those is the appointment of the vice chancellor and the appointment of any deputy vice chancellor. That cannot be delegated to anyone. Okay. So the attacks that we are seeing emanate from the appointment or release from appointment of a deputy vice chancellor. That's a responsibility of the university council, which in terms of uses on institutional status may not be delegated to anyone. Right? So if there is any structure that should be investigated, is the university council. Okay. Because they are the only ones in terms of UCT's own institutional statute yeah. that may or that can appoint a deputy vice chancellor and otherwise also release a deputy vice chancellor. If I'm a vice chancellor and a deputy vice chancellor, I'm line managing a deputy vice chancellor, just like any other line management responsibility. When you have to reappoint or appoint, release from appointment, any person who reports to me, you have to get my views. Doesn't mean that I'm the, I'm the employer, you're getting my views. And I'm well within my rights to say, I cannot work well with this person. That does not lead to, to the fact that uh, I may have appointed or not appointed that person. You're just getting my views. And I give, I'm giving you my views in terms of my constitutional obligation. The only structure that may appoint or release from appointment any deputy vice chancellor is the investment council. So if there have been problems with the appointment or the release of, from appointment of a deputy vice chancellor, it means the council did not do its job properly. Right? Maybe, contrary to the institutional statute, maybe they, de they delegated that responsibility to someone or to some structure. Okay. The question is, they need to be investigated as to why they did that, because that's not allowed. Right. But, 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 but Dr. Chinyoka, while you are there and uh, as Mukai will be coming in, but now then there's the very same council through all these other structures that might be in support to the status quo, are not saying what you are saying, you and the concerned staff, both staff and, and academics. They are saying the vice chancellor must be investigated and only the chairperson of council must be investigated, not the body itself council. What do you make of that, Dr. Chiyok? And also, what role does HR play? Because we hear of the so-called non-disclosure agreements. What would you say to that? Yeah, but the, like I said earlier on, remember we are dealing with a manufactured crisis. Okay. Dealing with a manufactured crisis and it's coordinated within, between the government structures that are dysfunctional right now to Senate, and we don't even know if we still have a council at, at the University of Cape Town, right? because we now have a functionalized structure okay. of whose members, if they are not happy with a decision, they run to the media, so they are in the daily maverick before the meeting is even over, and so, so, so we don't even know whether we have a university council or not. So we just have now factions right, that have their own agenda. Right? that are now perpetuating this manufactured uh, crisis that is coming from Senate, because remember, members of Senate are also members of council, right? at least three of them. Right? So, so, so what we have now is a council that is acting outside of the Higher Education Act. If you look at uh, Section 27.7b, I think, of the Higher Education Act, it is very clear that any member of the university council when they deliberate in the university council, they must deliberate on issues in the best interest of the university. But that's not what is happening now. We now have factions who are now deliberating in the interest of their handlers. And we don't know who those handlers are. So that's why the narrative that is coming from those who have the structure of power is because they manufactured the crisis with the sole purpose of saying this individual, that individual, and that individual, which is the chair of council, the vice chancellor, and now lately the deputy chair of council of must be investigated. Yeah. Right? So that was their, that was their, their, their main purpose. But because now the, 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 the story is unraveling and all of us are now pushing back to say, but the dysfunction is at the governance level. 
So, 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 so that's why now the plurality of voices, whether it's the concerned staff, concerned black academics, and now another group of concerned staff who have written to the institutional forum, to the copying the minister and the portfolio committee, to say, we need this to, re to be reloaded because to the extent that they were suggesting that the council must be dissolved because we don't even know if we still have a council anymore. Because in terms of the Irish cash, they are no longer acting in the best interest of the event. They're now acting in the interest of people that we don't know, which is like what is happening in Stellenbosch, right? Where the DA is now showing, right? That the governance there must be in the interest of white person as, 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 as championed by the democratic. Okay, okay. In, in fact, white Africans uh, speaking persons. Okay, Stellenbosch. Mkaya, uh, your take on the matter. No, I think the doc uh, is, is, is skating, is, uh, you know, is on, on point with that. Okay. Uh, and, and, and it shows also really how fluid these decisions become. Okay. Uh, in that they are based on, on, on who, who on, on the face value. If this is a white person, you know, uh, the whole people throw their toys out of the court is just dramatic and stuff. And, and that's why it's, uh, you for the, I'm I'm so I'm so sad for people who insist that there's no race in these issues. I'm very sad because you re, re, you realize that race politics are, are at play, and they've always been in play because uh, the the whole culture has been actually threatened. The culture of doing things, and that is why you you have them coming out guns blazing from all sectors. I mean, look at at Stellenbosch for instance. Uh, yeah, you have the DA already. Uh, using this matter because at the heart of that is a particular culture that has been kept intact for the longest time and is now being threatened. And so it warrants for them that kind of approach to this. And so, 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 so for, for me, Mkai, I'm always saying, uh, you know, let, let, us, let us take stock from what is happening. These things don't just happen. You know, there are reasons why the reactions are some, sometimes so unwarranted usually. Because mm. certain things are being threatened here, and 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 no one no one who claims not to see race is able to understand these issues, and, and that's why I'm hoping I'm I'm really hoping that in as much as commissions uh, really we we have now a history of commissions here, and the doctor also indicated uh, there's not much that hap happened with these issues, but but it does take uh, people within the spaces to make sure that these things get uh, get to be discussed in the public domain. The difference between now and in the in the past is that these things now get to be known by us. We did not yeah. know of these things in the past, yeah. and that is why also every time when people speak about corruption and 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 want to reduce everything that we do to corruption, I always ask, what what are we comparing this basically? Yeah, from the past now because in the past we were not privy to some of these issues. So what is it that we are using this thing to compare? Whether we are now most corrupt or that we were corrupt uh, in the past, so 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 people tend to not think it's because we are we suddenly have an eye story. You know, it's 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 eye historical. What has happened uh, since 1994 is a clean sleep, clean. You know, with the tabula rasa, as if nothing happened before that. So so I'm I'm always very careful, Kanya, uh, also to just criticize uh, black leadership in the presence of white people because I don't want to be a reference point to white people. They, okay. they use all of these things so that we as black people do these kinds of things. And that's why I'm saying if there's, if, if we have a covenant, if we have a contract with black people, we can then get in one room and say, Mkai, you are messing up here. And we can tell you that thing. But I'm very careful not to say these things in the public because I, white people are too happy uh, just to have a black reference point to some of the things that they are saying already because they just believe that we are not meant for these things that we are, that we are doing. Thanks, okay. Mkai. No, thanks, Mkaya. What you are raising, you and Dr. Chinyoka, I've got an article here, uh, Dr. Chinyoka. Uh, it was penned on July 2nd, 2020, uh, by Tabom Sibi, who's a professor and is the Dean of Education at the University of KwaZulu Natal. And he was responding to uh, what he calls the significance and importance, important implications of the Mayosi report for the entire higher education institutions. It's titled, Why the Mayosi Report Matters for Every Higher Education Institution. And uh, he then highlights a number of issues. 
and he opens it up Mkaya, by saying, the implications of the report are not only significant for UCT, the report points to systemic racism embedded in the institutional culture at UCT, but also the entire higher education system. He then went on further to say South Africa is yet to adequately reflect on sustained corrupt, and that's your point, Mkai, uh, to reflect on sustained corrupt cultures in, inherited from apartheid, mm. as well as new emerging cultures, mm. which continue to be defining features of both historically white and historically black higher education institutions in post-apartheid South Africa. This report highlights UCT's failure to support a man who was by all accounts a perfectionist, but found himself viewed as underperforming by his superiors. It flagged his failed attempts at resigning and finally a promising offer by the university, da, 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 da. The points that you pointed out, you need to be affirmed by white people. If white people say you are underperforming, you are not excellent, even if you are excellent, and you are, a, you, are, you, are an, you are an icon of excellence, you'll end up doubting yourself, which is a very important point that, you, that, that it brings. And he says one conclusion that can be made is that the pursuit of transformation in higher education is a personally risky undertaking for university managers. The type of pressure, the stress, and the risks that individual leaders undertake is often not worth the paycheck, Mukaya, mm -hmm. particularly for vice chancellors. Mm -hmm. That's where Professor Mamukheti Patin comes in here. That some are attacked for in the media, like the Daily Maverick has done. This is not to say that all salaries paid by to vice chancellors are justified, but he's just making that particular point. And then Dr. Chinyoka, the last part at the end, which is the point that you made and why people would be questioning. Because I got a question uh, yesterday by someone from UCT who says, but why are you calling someone who calls himself a spokesperson of concerned uh, UCT black staff and concerned UCT uh, black academics? Uh, what is the identity of, 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 of these concerned people? Then I read the following to this person that comes from that particular statement. The report asks us for a deep introspection on the, not, on, on the rod hidden in the institutional cultures of higher education institutions. We need to build institutional cultures that are truly transformative, ethical and aligned to a democratic and just society. The question is, how many more must die before these issues are taken seriously? That was my, my answer to the person. To say, because of the systemic problems and pressure, black people are going to come out and give the pushback in various forms and shapes because they refuse to become a statistic. So we cannot, because you are not the victim, you are not the one subjected to institutional racism, you would then not know how they feel. So how they come out, whether they come out as the Black Academic Caucus, whether they come out as concerned Black staff and concerned Black academics, or whether they come up as roads must fall, or they come up as fees must fall, or as Sheckville TRC. It's an expression of uh, uh, them wanting freedom, and uh, wanting to get out rid of the shackles that hold them in bondage. So I just thought, thought I should share this with you. And uh, as we go towards a close, Mukaya, I wanted to bring in uh, Panare Lefoka, but the time is against us. He has made a comment that I'm sure you have seen in the chat uh, towards the end. But I just want to acknowledge that uh, in the audience, we had people, but I thought I will not call them, I will not put them on the spot because we didn't have an agreement. Uh, uh, and some of them are here, some of them have left. I see the, the Deputy Vice Chancellor 
of transformation, student affairs and social responsiveness uh, of UCT has joined us. And I know one or two other members from council had also joined us, but we have agreed that uh, because of the shenanigans ongoing, they will join and uh, we will not know who they are, but uh, they just wanted to tap into this particular discussion. And I also recognize uh, the former chairperson, I think we has left, uh, of the Black Academic Caucus, uh, Comrade Tulani, he was in this particular session as well. So Mkaya and the doctor, Comrade Dr. Chinyoka, in one minute, uh, if you can just sum up and close uh, for us, the, as we can see, there's a lot that we can talk about and we have just scratched the surface, right? Uh, we might have got to think about another topic, Mkaya, uh, the covenant with Black <laughs> Azania or South Africa. Uh, and I know this is what Dr. Chinyoka likes very much. The concept of let us say it as it is in order for us to go forward and truly transform these institutions. We will try to look into that, me and my team, Mkaya. Let me get your closing remarks, Mkaya, in one minute and then one or two minutes and then go to Dr. Chinyoka and then uh, we, shall, we shall call it uh, an afternoon. Yeah. Okay, maybe just to say, uh, you see, the, uh, there is no black person who, who, who thinks that he is struggling for black self-reliance, self-determination, who has never felt one day of giving up in that. I, I think we need to say this. So uh, because of the many challenges that you're confronted with, but I, I, fi I find, I find uh, solace in the faith that uh, I, I'm a sucker uh, for, for Black people. And, and even, if they, even if they do abuse you, because Black people can be very abusive, uh, <clears throat> very abusive sometimes. You know, Takazo Mufugeng once said, it's difficult to love Black people. And, and we need to say that to each other as Black people. It's difficult to love Black people. But, but, but what we are called to do for black people is, is, is even if it's impossible, I like the words of, of, of the brother in the, uh, uh, the tower in the comment who said, we will do it or die trying. And that, and that is, and that is, that is what, 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 what picks me up, you know, after you, you want to give up, that, that, that this is what we are going to do, because if we don't do that, we have to try doing it, even if we die in the process. And so, I, I just hope sometimes that, that, that this could be something that is supplanted uh, across black, black, black communities, that, that it is not individually because these things, I don't experience them only as an individual black person, but as a group. And so because you don't feel it at this moment, do not deny the majority who are subjected to this. And if we begin to understand things like this, I think it becomes quite easy and fulfilling to, 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 to continue to get involved in these kinds of issues. I thank you, Mkaya. Uh, thank you, Mkaya. Quite uh, a mouthful. Comrade Dr. Chinyoka. Yeah, no, thank you. I would like to echo the words of, uh, the, of the professor. So what we need to do going forward as the collective of Black voices is to recognize that Blackness is under attack whenever there are injustice injustices that emanate from what are clearly uh, issues of systemic racism aimed at second guessing and de destroying um, the black uh, the black struggles and, uh, and and the fights for uh, of, of black persons, we as a collective of black persons, we need to come together and fight those injustices. I think it's it's important, just like what would have happened during uh, colonial times in the political dispensation, where we put our differences aside to fight injustices that come stem out of systemic uh, racism. Uh, there is always going to be time where we are going to confront our own challenges among ourselves, but we should not allow whiteness to prevail when it comes issues of attack on blackness, which is just attacks that uh, emanate from nothing, 
but systemic racism and the need by the white establishment to maintain the hegemony of whiteness. So that's uh, my closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Comrade Dr. Thierry Chinyoka and Comrade Professor Rodney Chaka. And in closing our comments from the chair, we close with the comments of the provincial chairperson of Azapo in Gauteng, Comrade Kanare Lefoka, who says, the responses from the panelists clearly indicates the state of paralysis and fear resulting from centuries of oppression that we find ourselves in as black people. There will always be a reason or rather excuses for not giving a practical meaning to the principle of self-reliance and confidence in our ability and expertise. We fail and we give up even before a genuine attempt is made. A failure that is waxed over by conscious solving, ex solving excuses. Uh, for example, a lack of resources, red, we do not control our economy, hostile political environment, etc. The truth is that we have, uh, we, we have not yet made the attempt as black people. He then closes by saying our, bat our battle cry should be, as you said, Makaya, it should be a simple one. We will die or we will do it or we will die trying. We would like to thank members of uh, the audience that joined us in Azania, South Africa, on the continent, abroad in the diaspora, and uh, also those who have joined us on Facebook Live on this very important discussion that is very timely and topical, governance versus institutional culture, the efficacy of commissions of inquiry in the functioning of institutions of higher learning. We want to thank you for having been with us and we say the next time we meet on discussions of this one, we will be exploring the covenant that we should have <laughs> with black people or black Azanians or black South African. We will be reflecting on the need for black unity. Like Dr. Chinyoka said, we will, when blackness is under attack, we forget about our minor differences. We will get to those once we have successfully fought against whiteness, white privilege, but also against the attempts of the white racist lynching mob that wants to lynch our black leaders, black vice chancellors, black chairpersons of council, particularly what is happening at the University of Cape Town, the vice chancellor of University of Cape Town, Professor Mamokheti Paken, the chairperson of council, Mebaba Alwa Ngonyama, and lately the deputy, Mepa Peladi Gwangwa. Azapo says, as a real ionized organization, we will not stand back. We have done that supporting Zandile Mafe, who's being accused of being in parliament, supporting uh, Mayor. Uh, 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 who was also harassed at the SABC. So when blackness is under attack, like Dr. Chinyoka said, Azapo will stand up. Thank you very much for having joined us. It was a pleasure uh, being with you. And uh, we shall close uh, with, our, with our song now. And uh, that shall take us uh, to where uh, we want uh, to be, and we just want to share uh, our 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 poster for now. Thank you.